years now and to have in schools. And the original philosophy of education for several, actually several centuries, was very simple. It had three objectives. The first thing education in America was to teach you was to teach you religion, morality, and knowledge in that order. That is the wording out of the very first federal education law ever passed. Schools existed to teach religion, morality, and knowledge, which is why I said yesterday, U.S. Supreme Court ruled in an 8-0 decision that if you're going to be a public school, you have to teach the Bible. We're not going to have a public school that won't teach the Bible. So that's what education was to do. Second thing that it was to do was to teach thinking skills. Now today we're all into learners. We're learners and we have learning skills. We used to be thinkers. We had thinking skills. Big difference. I'll show you the difference because that really is part of where I want to head today. And the third thing we did was to instill very high expectations. Uh, it was that until 1920, you finished school when you were 13 years old. And at 13 years old in 1920, everybody finished school. You either went to college or you got a permanent career because you're an adult when you're 13. That's the way it was in the Bible. When you're a Jewish boy at 13 or a Jewish girl, you have your bar mitzvah, bas mitzvah. You're an adult. You're, a, you're an elder in a synagogue at the age of 13. You already know the Bible. You've already gone through it. So we are to the point now where that according to the U.S. government today, the age of adolescence, which used to end at 13, and then it was moved up in the 1970s, 80s, 90s. It was the age of 18 is when you became, your, your adolescence ended. Today, according to the U.S. government, adolescent ends somewhere between the ages of 35 and 40. So we're considered an adolescent. We become, we seem to become more immature as a nation. So we used to instill very high expectations. Now, I want to go back to this one about thinking skills. The way we taught thinking skills, very different from what we do today. Uh, forensics is something we use to do that. Forensics is a Latin word. It comes from 1650. It means to learn the art of public argumentation. I want to show you some of the forensics that 13-year-olds did in America. Uh, it's going to be hard for you to read. I'll read it out loud because the print is small. But this is, a, this is an early book by one of the founding fathers, uh, Robert Troop Payne. And this talks about the forensics they were doing. And again, this is for 13, 14 year old Forensic, here this one, it says, whether the conduct of the patriots who destroyed the tea in Boston Harbor in 1773 is to be condemned. Here's what happened. You walk into the classroom, the teacher says, okay, today we're going to talk about whether the Boston Tea Party is something that should be praised or something that should be condemned. And I'll tell you now, if you know that incident in history, and if you think about it, it you can take either side of that. I mean, there's not a clear right and wrong on that. that. That's not like a Bible verse that says this is right and this is wrong. This is one that both sides can argue, and that was the point. They walk in, the teacher said, okay, you take four, you take against, you guys go after it right now. And so you start having to argue. It doesn't matter what your belief is. You have to argue and see what the weaknesses is in the other guy's argument. See if you can find those weaknesses and see if you can make strengths in yours. And after you get done, say, says, okay, now flip it. Let's go the other way. You go. And so you had to learn the art of public argumentation. You had to think through all the weaknesses, all the logic that wasn't there, what was missing. You had to develop your own strength of arguments, find out where your own weaknesses were. You thought through all of that, and you had to be able to present that publicly. Here's some more. Thesis or a forensic. I associate with no one, I employ no one who's not of my party in religion and politics. If you ain't in my group, I'm not going to hire you. Okay, let's talk about that. You take four, you take against. Now let's flip it, go the other way. Another one. Is there less danger in believing too much or too little? Is it more dangerous to believe too much or to believe too little? Let's go at it. And one more. Uh, is there more to be gained or more to be lost by a new translation of the scriptures for common use? Now, this is the stuff we were doing. This is, this is over 200 years old, what we're looking at here. This is the kind of arguments that we had for 13-year-olds all across America. This is what we see. We're teaching how to think. We're not causing you to be learners. We're teaching how to think. Uh, this, this concept of learning the art of public, public argumentation, that's thinking through something. So what happens is we also have Bible verses that speak to us very clearly. You may be familiar with this Bible verse. Most Christians tend to hear it a whole lot from their parents and church and pastors. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go when he's old and won't depart from it. You know, if we'll just teach you, teach you this stuff when you're young, when you're old, you'll come back to the faith if you leave. No, that's not what it says. If you look at the actual original Hebrew, it doesn't say train up a child. It says catechize a child. Now, catechism is a specific teaching method. It is the way that you teach subjects. It is, it, it's the use of questions and answers. We believe this so much that in America, back in that day when we had, um, we had 
13-year-olds going to college all the time. And, and by the way, one of the things that we do in the summer, we have leadership training in the summer two weeks at a time. We bring in 18 to 25-year-olds, and we'll go through this leadership training, going back to a lot of this stuff. We have now, we have kids that come in, they're working on their PhDs, and they have their master's degrees, and they're already teaching 18 through 25. And we give all of them the eighth grade exit exam from 1920. Haven't had a single person pass the eighth grade exit exam from 1920. It's like they are so much more advanced than where we are, and this is even for those that are working on PhDs. So catechize a child, you know, it's exactly what we did. Let me show you, I mentioned yesterday we have 120,000 documents from before 1812. We have thousands of documents out of education. Look at the textbooks and the titles of the textbooks. A catechism on ancient history. We taught world history by using a catechism. We have a catechism of agricultural chemistry and geology. We have a catechism on American law. We have a catechism on etymology, which is science, the study of insects. You have a catechism on American history. You have a catechism on astronomy. You have a catechism on music. You have catechism on electricity. You have catechism on, geogra on geography. You have catechism on mineralogy. You have catechism on chemistry. You have catechism on the... We did everything with catechisms. We had a lot more knowledge. We had a lot more retention. We thought a lot better. Because the Bible says if you catechize someone when they're young, when they're old, they won't lose that. Well, that's a teaching method. It's not just teach people the Bible when they're young and they'll always remember it. That's not true. If you teach them through a catechism, they're going to remember it. And that's what we did, was we believe the Bible. And so this is the educational teaching method we use. Now, we don't like it. They, oh, the question and answers, that's so boring. Let's have something that's a lot more interactive. And yeah, we've got a lot more interactive stuff, but we're not doing real well on educational achievement now. It's actually slipped. And that's why I say an eighth grade ex exam from the 1920s, we haven't found anybody that can pass it today. And that's at the college level and above. So what happens with the catechism is you learn to answer questions. You ask who, what, when, where, why and how. And if you can answer those questions, you have thought through something, you now have ingested the content, you understand the content, and you can argue it to someone else. You can persuade them, convince them. You can stand your own ground. You're not going to get picked off. You've thought through all the stuff. So this is what we did with catechisms. Now, this changed, and the reason it changed and the, and the time it changed, it changed in the 1920s. We said, a lot of educators back then said, let's not do this thinking thing anymore. And so particularly what was called the Progressive Education Association in the 1920s, they came up with five systemic changes to the pedagogy of the way we teach. What we do in schools today is the result of what they implemented 100 years ago. Uh, the five things they did, one of the things they did, and by the way, these were the leading educators back at that point in time. You had Robert Ingersoll and Francis Wayland Parker and Lester Ward, and you had Kirk Kilpatrick and you had John Dewey, all these guys, these are the guys who say, oh, no, no, we got to do education there. We've been doing it this way a hundred years. Let's try something new. And so we started doing something new just because it was time to do something new, and these guys wanted to do it, and everybody bought into it. And so what happened was we changed from thinking and said, instead of emphasizing thinking, let's, let's make everyone a learner. Let, let, let's do learning. And so what happens is when you change an emphasis from thinking to learning, what you do is you take the emphasis off the student and you put the emphasis on the teacher. You're going to learn what I tell you. Now, no longer are you going to feed yourself. And you're going to be, see, being a thinker is like learning how to fish as opposed to someone giving you a fish. When you're a learner, someone's giving you the food you're going to eat, and you eat what they give you. When you're a thinker, you can go out and catch food for yourself, and you can think for yourself, and that's the difference. We've had this fundamental shift. And so the emphasis on the student and the teacher, this is the first time in American history that we introduced testing that was fill in the blank. We introduced the testing of true and false. We introduced the testing of multiple choice, and it was because I'm your teacher. Did I tell you this or this, true or false? I told you this and fill in the blank. Did I tell you ABC? See, we're teaching you to recite back to us what we told you. See, we're, we're, now, we're in charge of all the information that goes to you, which makes us a small end of the funnel. Everything comes through us. This is where Jesus said in Luke 640, every student when he's fully trained will be like his teacher. That's not necessarily a good place to be. You want to be able to feed yourself and train and grow bigger than your teacher and have the right view. You want to be able to think through everything. And your teacher may have a bias that's not accurate. You don't want that bias if it's not an accurate bias. You want truth. And so that's what we did. But that changed in the 1920s. And so this is what we do today is we don't teach thinking. We teach learning. That's the way our tests are as well. As a result, that makes American people a very gullible people. We're open to indoctrination. Whatever the views of our teacher are, that's what's going to become my views as well, which is why, as I pointed out yesterday, four out of five do not believe there is absolute moral truth in America. 
how can you say there's not absolute moral? Two out of three Christians don't think there's absolute moral truth because we've been indoctrinated. We, we have gone through indoctrination that says, oh, no, you get to live your own life. You get to determine your own truth. You can be whatever you want to be. There's 92 genders. You choose the one you want to be. No, just because someone believes that doesn't mean that's true. And so what happens is we're now very gullible for a lot of things that would never have flown in previous generations when we were thinkers. They've never flown in any other culture, any other civilization, any other era, any other millennia. They're now floating in America because nobody questions them. It's just we're, we're in this gullible kind of state. So having said all of that, what I want to do is talk about how we used to use reason in a way that we don't now. We used to use thinking skills. To do that, I want to just start with with America for a moment. Let me put America in perspective. Um, if you're from other nations, don't know what you think about America, what I'm going to show you really doesn't matter what you think about America. It's statistical. It's factual. When you look at where America is with our form of government, the Constitution that we've had since 1787, you look at where we are now under the Declaration Constitution, our governing documents, um, we are unique among the 195 nations of the world. There's 195 nations this year at the UN. It goes up and down every year. Jesus said there'd be wars and rumors of wars. It was that way when he left. It'll be that way till he gets back. You've got a revolution over here. Somebody has a civil war over here. This nation took over. The, it, it changes. Every year the numbers go up and down. This year there's 195 nations at the UN. We have had our constitution for 231 years. Now, that's the only constitution we've ever had in our entire history. We've had one. Let me show you what's happened to other nations in the world in that same period of time. For example, if you're from France, you've had 15 constitutions in the same time we've had one. Just look at the other nations. Now, whatever you think about America, there's something unusual here in the fact that we've only had one constitution in our entire lifetime. This is significant. I was in Poland earlier this year dealing with government officials over there, took a congressional delegation to Poland. And I, poke, I spoke to people in Poland that in their life, they have lived through nine constitutions in their own life. They've experienced nine constitutions. We never think about that. Do you know what the average length of a constitution in the history of the world is? The average length of the constitution in the history of the world is 17 years. That's what most nations average. We, 231, and by the way, most nations in the world average a violent revolution every generation or so. We've only had one. That's different. So regardless of whether you think America is any good or not any good, we are unique with stability. We have stability like no other nation in the history of the world. We also have creativity. There's a lot of ways to measure creativity. You have particularly what are called international copyrights and patent laws. America represents 4% of the world's population. We're not a very big nation. 4% of the world's population should produce 4% of the world's whatever. If you're 12% of the world's population, you should produce 12%. America's 4% of the world's population every single year produces more innovations, more medical discoveries, more cures, more, more technology. We have more science. We have more entertainment, arts, media, DVDs, movies than the other 96% of the world combined. Now, we are so used to technology that we think it's pretty normal, natural, and it's not. I was in Germany recently with military bases over there, and I got to stay at a five-star hotel, which is pretty cool. I don't get to stay at many five-star hotels, and then I found out they don't have internet at that five-star hotel. I'm going, are you kidding me? Even Motel 6s over here have internet. I mean, we're so used to totally different stuff, and you find that across the world, what we take for granted, many other nations, even advanced nations, don't have what we, what, what we get to enjoy here. In addition to our creativity, there's our productivity, there's our prosperity. You see, we are 4% of the world's population. We produce 25% of the world's gross domestic product. I'll show you kind of how this works. And I'm a cowboy. I have a ranch out west of here, and I'm in agriculture, farming and ranching. Farming and ranching in America is only 1% of the world's gross, excuse me, is only 1% of America's gross domestic product. In other words, agriculture is only 1% of what America produces. But every year, that 1% produced in America produces enough food to feed the entire world. Now, the problem is we can't get it to everywhere in the world that needs it, but we produce enough in America every year to feed the entire world. America is only 66 in the world in percentage of farmable land. 65 nations have a greater percentage of farmable land than we do and don't produce near as much. For some reason, we're able to take what we have and make it go further than any other nation. We have a higher productivity. Again, 4% of the world's population, we produce a fourth of the world's products. 
unbelievable stuff. This is called American exceptionalism. This is something that a lot of professors don't like. I wrote a book about this a few years ago. Professors came out of the woodwork to say, that's a myth. America's not different. America's not special. No, I'm sorry. Statistically speaking, America is exceptional. You're welcome to your opinion, but it's wrong because truth is what it is. Statistics are what, I don't care whether you think gravity takes you up. If you jump, when I jump, it's going to take me down just like it will you. You can have your opinion, but you're wrong. It's going to take you down. It's easy stuff. So you can say America's not special, that's fine, you have your opinion, but the statistics prove otherwise. I mean, that's just that's the way it is. So American exceptionalism, what is it that made us different? What, what is it that made us unique? And what happens is no professor likes to define it today. And there are some good professors across the nation, but generally, by and large, they're, they're, they're pretty hostile to America. American exceptionalism is what describes the unprecedented stability, freedom, and prosperity that is the result of institutions and policies that are produced by a unique governing philosophy. Now notice the sequence here. We have a philosophy of government, and that's what produces our institutions and policies, and those institutions and policies are what produce the stability, freedom, and prosperity. But it's the, institution, it's the philosophy of government that's the most important. It, whatever, every nation has a philosophy of government, and it will produce fruit. Every idea is going to produce fruit of some kind, good or bad. So when you look at our philosophy, we're producing fruit different from any other nation in the world. Therefore, our philosophy must be a little bit different. Uh, uh, let me take you back to eighth grade earth science. In eighth grade earth science, we were taught about the fruit trees, that in fruit trees, there's three parts of a fruit tree. You have first what you plant down in, in the ground, you, the seed you plant, that seedling, that seed, and then it starts growing. And then as it emerges above ground, it starts building the trunk and the branches and the infrastructure, and that's the second part. And then finally, it gets to the foliage up top, and that's where it produces the fruit, and that's the third part of the fruit tree. Well, that's exactly the, the way the nation is. We planted a seed in the ground. That was the philosophy of government, it grew the institutions and policies, it grew the infrastructure, and that infrastructure is, is our institution policies, and that's what produced that foliage up top that produces the fruit that everybody likes. Everybody likes the freedom, the prosperity, the technology, all the stuff we have. But the most important part is the seed you planted. I mean, if you like apples, don't plant a lemon seed because you will not get apples on a lemon seed. There is a reason that no other nation in the world is producing the fruit up top that America has produced because they haven't planted the same seed. Now, I speak nations across the world, help them do governments and constitutions, and I always take them back to key principles. It's not that the American Constitution is what's cool. It's the principles that we use in the American Constitution because they will work for any nation at any point in time across history. It's just you have to use those principles. I mentioned yesterday so many of the principles, what we have the free market system, what we have in our educational system, used to have in our educational system, what we have in our system of government, they were all Bible-based. Any nation that will take those Bible principles, they will prosper when they use them. God's no respecter of persons. He's no respecter of nations. If you take, except for Israel, if you take those principles and apply them, he will, he will make them work. It's real simple. So what is the seed or the philosophy that caused American exceptionalism? It's real simple. We said it in our founding documents. When the guys created this nation, they told the world what they were doing. It was in the Declaration of Independence. In that Declaration of Independence, they started with 126 words that gave five principles of government. Everything in the Constitution goes back to these five principles of government. This is the foundation. This is the seed we planted, and we told the world. And that's what the Declaration says. We want to declare to the world the causes which impel us to the separation. So we told everybody what the philosophy was. And nobody pays attention to it today. Most folks have never even read the Declaration of Independence. It's relatively short. It starts with 155 words that set forth our government, 27 grievances showing how those rights were violated. And then it concludes with the Declaration saying we're relying on God to get these principles brought forward. And so we, we said with a, uh, we, we told the world that we're doing this with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, appealing to the supreme judge of the universe for the rectitude of our intentions. I mean, we told the world we're going to God over this. So what happens is, let me read you those 126 words right out of the Declaration. It says, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which connect them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station in which the laws of nature and nature's God entitles them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, 
that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. 126 words, five principles. Let me take you to the five principles. The first thing they said in that section, they talked about what was called the laws of nature and nature's God. That's a phrase that we don't understand that much today. It was a very popular phrase back then. It was, if you want to, an idiom that they used all the time. Everybody knew what it was. They knew the origin of it. But I'll tell you what it is. It establishes that there is an absolute right and wrong. There are morals that are right. There are absolute morals, kind of like the Ten Commandments. So the first thing we told the nations, we believe there is absolute moral truth, that there are things that are absolutely right, absolutely wrong. And once we establish what the rights and wrongs are, then we can hold these truths to be self-evident. You can't have truth until you establish what's right and wrong. Truth is based on, on absolutes. I mean, like gravity. I don't care what you think about gravity. If you jump off the top of the Empire State Building, you will splat on the ground below it. You can have all the opinions you want. The gravity won't affect me. It's going to. Moral laws affect you whether you agree with them or not. You may not agree with God's moral laws. They will have an impact on you. One of the things, we have a national radio program. We have about 371 stations where we do daily broadcasts. And one of the things we do about every two weeks is bring out all the new statistical scientific information that absolutely shows unequivocally that what the Bible said in certain areas was absolutely right. Science will end up always proving God right because God has the absolute truth. That's what we believe. Let me take you back to this phrase, the laws of nature, nature's God. It came out of the most famous law book of that generation. It was a law book written by Sir William Blackstone, Commentaries on the Laws. He wrote it in 1766. It took four years to write all the volumes. It finished in 1769. Thomas Jefferson said an American attorney studied that book like Muslims, Muslims studied the Koran. Every American knew that book, top to bottom. And what Blackstone says, and they're on the laws of nature and nature's God, he says, this is the dual revelation of God. Whoa, God doesn't have two revelations. Yeah, he didn't say two gods. He said one God, a dual revelation. He said the first part, the laws of nature, is exactly what we see in Romans 1. For example, I don't know about you, but I have, I have critics who come to me and say, you know, you Christians, you, you claim to have a loving God. How can you have a loving God if he would send people to hell who have never heard the gospel? Huh? What do you say to that? Great question. What I say to that is exactly what Paul said to that in Romans 1.20. Paul said everything that can be known about God, including the intricacies of Godhead, have been revealed through what he has created so that even the heathen are without excuse. Now, according to what Paul, God has so revealed himself in his creation and nature that you don't need anything else to know. And by the way, Paul said, even the intricacies of the Godhead. Godhead, that's pretty deep theology. Yeah, but it's all there in nature. See, what happens is we don't spend time thinking much about nature today. We're told in Psalm 46, 10, be still, know that I'm God. If you get out in God's stuff and you just sit down and you have no agenda except to just watch and observe and learn, it is amazing because everything God wants us to know is there. Now, as Blackstone pointed out, in addition to Romans 1, which is the first revelation of God, the laws of nature, the laws that God has put in nature, the second revelation, Blackstone said, you know, after Adam and Eve sinned, sin entered the world, and it clouded our thinking, and because of sin, we don't see as clear as we used to. So God, in his compassion for our human frailty, said, let me just write it down for you because you're not seeing this. And that's what we call the scriptures. That's the laws of nature's God. Script, the Bible is the laws of the God who created nature. So between the laws of nature that God created, and then after sin, he said, you're not seeing it. Let me just write it for you. The laws of nature and the laws of nature's God, that's where we find exactly what's right and wrong. Now, for a few minutes, let's just put the Bible aside. I'm going to show you how that we can establish absolute rights and wrongs without any reference to the Bible whatsoever. We can use the laws of nature. And this is where it requires reason and thinking and using our brain and asking questions, etc. So let me take you into some of the first part just on the laws of nature. Let me start with the law of self-defense. Someone asked me about it yesterday after we were done. So let me talk about this for a minute. And by the way, I told you I'm a cowboy. I'm a cowboy from out west of here. We got the ranch. We do all the stuff with the horses that go with it. And we end up in really rough parts of the country. We end up in places with our horses. You go, how'd you get your horse there in a cave like that? And it's just a whole different lifestyle. And what we do tends to be fairly rugged. And we can be in very rough parts of the country. I just got back from uh, up in Wyoming. We were driving cattle in Wyoming. We had a you know, had to go over the top of the mountains driving cattle. And we had... 16 miles and we drove cattle and the cattle were stretched out for two miles and so it's it's like the old west and, and that is that's me that's what i do and so a, a matter of fact where we ride is often very dangerous um we happen to be going around a curve here and right when we make a left on this trail right when he turns around this trail which we're going down 
my right stirrup was hanging over the valley for about 400 feet. And so if my horse slips, we're both dead. I mean, that's just it. And so when I do what I do with, with horses, I've got to have a horse I really trust. We get along really well, spend a lot of money uh, taking care of that horse, getting good feed, having good, good vets, getting a place for it to stay. I mean, we put a lot of effort into that because our life depends on it. If I come to the edge of a cliff and put my horse's nose over the cliff and say, go down that goat trail on the side, if she gives me any grief at all, we both die. If I come to the river and say, you got to swim that river, you got to get to the other side, she does. And so I've got a great relationship with my horse. I have several horses and great relationship. And we spend time together. She knows how I think. I know how she thinks. I know how she's going to react. She knows what to expect of me. And it worked really well until she had a young foal. And when that colt was born, I went into the barn to feed her. And she came after me with her teeth to tear me up. She came after me with her heels to kick me out. Because, you see, God has put in the nature of what he's made that I will defend my life, I will defend the life of my young, and I will defend where I live, my property. I do not need Exodus 22.2 to tell me I have the right of self-defense. I do not need the two passages in Nehemiah. I do not need what Jesus said in in Luke. I don't need those. I've got them. But I don't need it because everything in nature, if you mess with, if you try to take its life, the life of its family, or if you try to take its home, they will come after you. And I don't care if it's a mouse. If you're trying to hurt a mouse, they will turn and bite you. They're not going to do much damage, but they will do everything they can to try to defend their life and, and their home. So that's a law of nature. The law of self-defense, the, the right to defend myself against any kind of attack or aggression, I don't need the Bible to justify that. I, I can do it without that. And, and literally, that's, what we, that's a law of nature. God has put it. See, we also raise sheep. Um, in raising sheep, we've got, had a little kitten, just a really cute little kitten, a really like it was a people cat and for whatever reason that cat and that that one of the ewes in, in the flock they kind of bonded up I, I don't know why or but they did and so at night when that ewe would lie down in the pasture that kitten would go and crawl under her wool and and sleep in this nice warm place to sleep and it was just a really cute relationship until that ewe had a set of twins and then when she had a set of twins, that kitten went out that night to crawl under the ewe, and she just stomped that kitten into the ground. I mean, she wasn't going to... Now, it didn't kill the kitten, but it was the nature kicked in. You don't mess with my kids. You don't... And, and so Congress can pass any law it wants prohibiting ewes from stomping kittens in the ground, and it's not going to make any difference. It's a law of nature. There's no human law that will change or alter or regulate what God has put in the nature of what he's created. So that's one, the the law of self-defense. If you go to the law of liberty, there are 10 million known species in nature. 10 million. There's not a single species that enslaves any other species ever. And we used to be told, well, there's one species of ants that enslaves another. And now they said, you know, that's really not true. It's symbiotic. They both help each other, and it's not an enslavement. There is nothing in nature. 10 million species. There is no slavery in nature. Now, that's a law of nature. The law of nature is the law of liberty. That's one of the laws of God. Well, why didn't our founding fathers believe that? Because they were all a bunch of pro-slavery. No, they weren't. One-fourth of the founding fathers were pro-slavery. Three-fourths were ardent anti-slavery. And the three-fourths told the one-fourth, guys, what you're doing, it violates the laws of nature and of nature's God. Because we're talking Isaiah 61, we're talking Luke 4, we're talking uh, Leviticus 25, all these verses on liberty in the Bible, you're violating that. Today, our problem is we can name the pro-slavery founding fathers, we can't name the anti-slavery, and so we get taught a particular viewpoint. You need to get taught the good, the bad, the ugly. You need to know what truth is from side to side. So the law, liberty was a law of nature. And by the way, the same thing with abortion. 10 million species in nature, there's not a single species that kills its young while it's still in the womb. Abortion is a violation of all laws. I don't care if you believe in evolution and creation. I'm a huge creation guy. Your evolution, great. You show me anything in your system that kills its young while it's still in the womb. Never does. It's a violation of all laws of nature. Now, I can also show you all the Bible verses, whether it's John 1 or Psalm 135 or Jeremiah 1. I can go through all the Bible verses, show you the pro-life positions. I can show you what Deuteronomy and Leviticus said about protecting the unborn child. I don't need to. The laws of nature tell me that abortion is wrong. Same thing with homosexuality. 
there are, again, 10 million species in nature. There's only half a dozen species where homosexuality ever exists in nature. And even those species, it is never a lifestyle. There is not a homosexual lifestyle anywhere in nature, period. Even in the half dozen species where it does exist, it's always an aberration even in that species. Now, I can show you 1 Corinthians 6. I can show you Leviticus. I can show you all the Bible verses, what the Bible says about homosexuality, Romans 1. Don't need to. I can show you the laws of nature. The laws of nature. Did you know that our U.S. Supreme Court, even 15 years ago, and it's not a, a Bible-believing conservative su Supreme Court, the Supreme Court, even 15 years ago, said that homosexuality was a, quote, crime against nature. They didn't use the Bible to say it's wrong. They used the laws of nature to say it's wrong. And that's what nature tell, tells us, is homosexuality. Let me take you to transgender, because this is the new kind of thing that's happening. I mentioned yesterday, today, you got 92 legally recognized genders today. Your Facebook profile, you get to choose from 74 genders. Go back to cowboy world for a minute. I was in North Dakota. We were doing a roundup in North Dakota, the Badlands in North Dakota, a pretty rugged area where all those tr trees are. That's where creeks are, but that's where, the, that's where the cattle hang out. They see people about once a year. They're wild as deer. And so what we have to do is go down in, in, in those, those, wood, those um, tree areas and drive the cattle out. We get them up on top of the mesa. We start a cattle drive, so we had 1,200 cattle going across the top of the mesa. And what we do is we drive in the pens on top of the mesa. And the reason we do is we want the calves out of there because the calves, there's seven diseases that will kill cattle. We have to vaccinate the cattle. We need to put ear tags on them so we know which ranch they belong to because they've been born out on, on various places. And so what we do is we send a cowboy in, and he will rope a single calf and bring that calf out. We had 590 calves. And so they bring the calf out, and there's four or five of us that will drop on top of that calf. I happen to be the one in the blue plaid shirt in the middle. And what I'll do is I'll drop down and give them an injection to make sure they're healthy. To make sure they're safe. And so 590 calves that we did, and, and the families all get together. This, there's a cowgirl there on the left from one of the ranches, cowboy on the right from one of the ranches. You know what? We treated 590 calves, and nobody had any difficulty telling which was male and which was female. It was really easy to do. All you had to do was use your eyes. For 5,500 years, if you wanted to know what gender you were, you looked between your legs. Now we look between our ears. What is this deal? You know, it's crazy stuff. So I don't need anything in the Bible to tell me there's two genders, although the Bible does tell me that. We're told four times in the Scripture, and God created them male and female, period, end of story. The laws of nature and the laws of nature's God. They both say the same thing. So this is the standard that we use at the beginning. I'll keep going. There's other examples in addition to, to transgender property. Doesn't matter where you are in nature, from the time you're born, you will stake out something that you consider to be your territory, your home. Now, when you die, something else is going to take it. But while you're alive, you have a right to property, where you're going to live, where you're going to stay, what your territory is. So whether it's an elk or whether it's an eagle or whatever, they get this territory. If it's a crocodile, they stake out territory that's their home. And it's theirs while they live. And so the right of private property. Now, I can also take you two of the Ten Commandments deal with protecting private property, not to mention all the other Bible verses. In addition to that, accumulation of profit. You're allowed in the Bible to accumulate as much as you can and to keep it. We see that in the parables that Jesus told in Luke 19 and Matthew 25. But in nature, nobody says, oh, Mr. Squirrel, you have way too many acorns. You need to share them with everyone else. There is no socialism in nature. It does not exist. Now, they may cooperate together in families, but they have the right to accumulate and keep as much as they can, whether that's the mountain lion, whether that's the alligator that takes his prey to the bottom of the lake, whether that's a pack rat, whether it's a beaver who stores up stuff in his lodge, doesn't matter. You have the right to accumulate and keep. You don't get penalized for having too much. Uh, the right of association, you know, if I'm an Angus cow, I can decide I'm going to hang out with the Guernsey cows, or I can decide that I'm going to hang out with the Santa Gertrudis or the Charlotte. I can even decide I'm going to hang out with goats or donkeys. I get to choose where I hang out. Today, the government says, oh, you're a baker. You will, ba you will hang out with homosexual wedding. And you no, no, no. I get the right to choose who I hang with. That's the right of association. And that's a natural right, and that's a right in the Bible as well, 1 Corinthians 6. We also have the right of theft. What are you talking about theft? Well, see, this is where it's really kind of difficult for me because when I look at the laws of nature, theft appears to be fairly common in nature. I mean, with my four horses, when I feed my four horses, none of the horses eat their own food. They all go steal it from the other three. So it's kind of like musical feed. They all go steal from the others. And the same thing with adultery. Monogamy is not common in nature. I mean, that's why in a cow herd, you got one bull and 20 cows in a herd. Monogamy is not common. 
Incest is very common. That's why a cowboy usually does not ride a Mustang. Some Mustangs can be good, but Mustangs have been inbred for so many generations that they're small, they don't have much strength, the stamina. We don't use Mustangs because they've been inbred for so long. Incest is really common in nature. The same with murder. I mean, if you want to see what murder looks like in nature, you need to have a chicken coop and let a skunk into a chicken coop. What a skunk does in chicken coop, they bite the heads off all the chickens and they sling the body around. It just sprays blood everywhere. They're murderers. They're mass murderers. They go in and just wipe out chickens. They don't eat them. It's not for food. They're just murderers. So if we're saying the laws of nature teach us what's right and wrong, then what do you do with things like that? This is where Blackstone said, you know, since sin came in, things just aren't the same, so God had to help us out. So he wrote it down for us, and that's why things like the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments tell us real simple, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't commit murder. See, between the laws of nature and the laws of nature's God, we have a very comprehensive code of what is right and wrong. We have a good understanding of what is right and wrong. And by the way, in the, fifth, in the Seventh Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, this is what we call the common law. The common law is the laws of nature, nature's God. That's the laws on which we're supposed to run the country, is the laws of nature, nature's God. So that's the first thing we said that made us different from all other nations. We believe that God has established absolute rights and wrongs, and that's what we're going to use, and that's what we're going to recognize, the laws of nature and the laws of nature's God. And by the way, I will tell you that if you want to work on using your mind and get out and just think about nature. And I, I'll do this at time. I, I was working on the ranch a few weeks ago trying to kill off weeds. And I had an epiphany because I'm trying to kill thistles and cockleburs and, and grass burrs out of the pasture. And it struck me, you know, if I have a great pasture and I have one thistle that grows up in that pasture, within five years the entire pasture is thistles. On the other hand, if I have a field of thistles and plant a seed of wheat in it, that seed will never take over the thistles. It's always the weeds that take over the good stuff. It's not the good stuff that takes over the bad stuff. The only way I can get wheat to take over the field is if I plant so much of it that it has an abundance. And that really struck me. That's why Jesus tells us to be really careful about sin in our life. A little leaven leavens the whole loaf. If you let one thistle grow up, it will take over your life. And you can't just assume that because there's something good there, I don't have to cultivate it. If you don't cultivate the good, the bad will take it over. I mean, it's just, that's the law of nature. Briars take over forests all the time. Kudzu takes over Tennessee and Kentucky. I mean, the weeds take over. It's not the good things that dominate unless you put attention into it, which is why we're told back in, in, in uh, Genesis 1 that it's going to be with the sweat of your brow that you bring forth good stuff. And it really became clear when I was working in the pastures. I can look at an anthill and tell you how the federal budget is supposed to operate. Because if I study an anthill, you see, ants understand that there are seasons in life, that there's times when you have great abundance and there's times when you don't. There's times when the winter comes and there's not going to be any seeds for us to eat. So what we do as ants is we create a savings account. We go out in the spring and summer and we just bring it all in and we save it away because we're going to have to live the rest of the year when nothing's growing. See, what the government does is, says, oh, look at the great income we have. We're going to budget on the spring. It's spring. We have great income. And because they budget on the spring, when the winter comes, and it always does in economics, there will always be times in your life when you're going to have less than other times. You don't budget on the springtime. You budget on the winter time, trying to have a savings. If you don't have a savings account, you should. Proverbs 6 says, go to the ant sluggard. He lays up his provision. The ant has a savings account. See, there's so much in the Bible that God tells us, even about economics and, and, and the way budgeting should work. So that's why the laws of nature, nature, this is where we used to think about things. And this is why we had totally different policies than we do now, because there's just some things we do today that don't make sense at all. But we've been taught that that's what we should do, but it doesn't match up with the laws of nature, nature's God. The second thing that I would point to real quickly is after you get the absolute rights and wrongs, the second thing is it says all men are endowed by their creator. Now, they're created equal, endowed by their creator. What we just did here was we just told you there is a creator. You see, I've been involved in seven cases of the U.S. Supreme Court. They all deal some kind of religious expression, way, shape, fashion, form. Can you have prayer to football? Can you have prayer to high school football game? Can, can you have prayer to graduation? And so these, these cases we get involved with, the court says, oh, no, no wait a minute. There's, there's people in America who are atheists. They don't believe in God. And so in government, we can't take a position either for or against God. We've got to be completely neutral. That's not the way we were formed. This thing that there is a creator, that was, as they said, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. 
we're telling you we in America believe there is a God. Now, we don't require every individual to believe that. You're free to believe what you want to. But as a nation, we believe that there's a God. And it's very significant that when you look at the early state constitutions written by, for example, 1776, Ben Franklin. We talked about Ben Franklin yesterday. Ben Franklin wrote the Constitution of Pennsylvania for 1776. And Ben Franklin, who is not a Christian, he was a Bible guy, but he was not a Christian. Ben Franklin said, you can't hold office in Pennsylvania unless you believe that there is a God and unless you believe in the Scriptures and unless you believe in a future state of rewards and punishments. Now, what does that mean? A future state of rewards and punishments means I believe that there's a God and I will stand before Him and answer someday. 1 Corinthians 4, I'll answer for all the thoughts I've had. Romans or Hebrews 4, I'll answer for all the deeds I've done. Matthew 12, Jesus said you'll account for every idle word. I will give account for my words, my thoughts, and my actions. If you know that as a public official, your behavior suddenly changes. Because you see, every session of Congress, there are between 10 and 13,000 bills introduced every session of Congress. If we talked all this morning, got everybody together and said, all right, I want you to name every single measure you know of that Congress has dealt with this year, we'll probably come up with 25 or 30. Got news for you, it's between 10 and 13,000. There have been thousands of votes cast by every congressman. We don't know about it, which means most of what goes on in government goes on out of our sight, which means that if those guys don't feel a direct accountability to God, if they don't have a fear of God that says, man, if I sell out the people, God's going to nail me, and I'm looking at eternal judgment. I ain't going to do it. I'm going to do the right thing. If you don't have a cognizance that you're going to answer to God, then you don't have a reason, an incentive to do the right thing in private. You do the right thing in private because you recognize that nothing's private to God. He sees everything. He keeps up with everything. And so when we lose that cognizance of being God conscious, that's where our government turns in directions it shouldn't. And that's why we stayed God conscious as a government. Our philosophy of government is we're going to be God conscious because if we don't, you see, this is the first way of limiting government. The Bible teaches there should be limited governments. The Bible only gives a certain jurisdiction of things to governments. I mentioned yesterday the Bible does not allow the government to take care of the poor. They give them civil justice, but it's individuals and churches and, and families that take care of the poor. There's a jurisdiction that God put government in. Limited government. The first step in limiting government is to acknowledge that there's a God of the power higher in government. Because you see, the problem is government across the world, secular government, thinks that it is God. It's going to tell you what's right and wrong and what you can do and can't do and what's yours and what's not. But when you have a God that's higher than government, you can have a limited government. See, I can point to nations in Europe right now. If you homeschool in certain nations in Europe, you will go to jail because children do not belong to you. They belong to the state. That's just the position. Everything belongs to the state. I can take you to a nation in France, a very advanced, modernized nation, that if you share your faith there, you will go to jail. They call it proselytization. You don't have the right of free speech. See, we have so many things that we take for granted, but it came from the belief that God gave you certain things and, and government's not supposed to regulate it. So that's that's how we limited government. I love the way George Washington dealt with this. On the day that we finished the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments of the Constitution, George Washington called the entire nation to a day of national thanksgiving and prayer. And this is the reason that George Washington did. I mentioned we have all these old documents. This is the, the actual proclamation he did calling the nation to pray and thank God because we've just finished the Bill of Rights, which protects our inalienable rights. This is what he explained right here. This is the reason he did it. He said, it is the duty, and the word duty is a very important word. It doesn't mean today what it meant then. In their dictionaries, the word duty is a legally binding contractual obligation. Today, the word duty defined in dictionary says that which one ought to do. I'll tell you, there's a big difference between what you ought to do and a legally binding contractual obligation. He says, we have a legally binding contractual obligation as nations, not as individuals. Our nation has a legally binding contractual obligation to do four things. To acknowledge the providence of God. Number two, to obey His will. Number three, to be grateful for His benefits. Number four, humbly to implore His protection and favor. That is the duty of nations. See, we weren't secular in any way, shape, fashion, or form. We had a legally binding contractual obligation to acknowledge God, to obey His will, to be grateful for Him, and, and to humbly implore His protection and favor. So that's the second thing that made America unique, was we were not started as a secular nation. We said there is a God who gives absolute rights and wrongs, and God is in charge. We're not, this is not a secular nation. The third thing that we said was that to, they're endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. So what we've said here is there are a certain set of rights that come from God. 
The reason that is significant, it's another way of limiting government, is what we've done there by telling the, the government there's certain rights that didn't come from government, we have created jurisdiction. So let me see if I can explain this. On my ranch, I have a red pickup and got it outside. I like my red pickup. I've had a red pickup for several generations of red pickups. I keep buying new red pickups. My son, Tim, also out on the ranch, he does a lot of speaking at colleges, universities, etc. Tim comes out to the ranch, and the problem is he's got a black pickup. And you shouldn't have black pickups. So when he was out there, I just spray painted his truck red because everybody needs a red truck. It's just real simple. Actually, no. Anything I own, I can spray paint red. I can spray paint my cows red. I can spray paint my pastures red. I can spray paint my roads. I can't spray paint his truck red because it doesn't belong to me. And what happened here was we said, government, there are certain rights that you can't spray paint red. You can't regulate them. You can't touch them because they didn't come from you. They came from God. They're not your property. And so what we did was we acknowledged that there are certain rights, uh, for example, in the Declaration of Independence. And, and, and by the way, let me define inalienable rights because that's not a term we use often today. John Dickinson, who's one of the founding fathers, a signer of the Constitution, strong Christian guy. John Dickinson said, an inalienable right is a right which God gave to you and which no inferior power has a right to take away. If God told, told you you can do it, government nor anybody else can stop you from doing it because God told you you could. You have the same thing, Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton said an inalienable right is a, their rights not to be rummaged for among old parchments or musty records. They're written as with a sunbeam in the whole volume of human nature by the hand of divinity itself and can never be erased or obscured by any moral power. These are rights that God himself gave to individuals. He didn't give them to Americans. He gave them to individuals. Just because you're human, there's a certain set of rights that you get. The third person talking about this is John Adams. I really like the way he said it. He said, an inalienable right is a right that's antecedent to all earthly government. It's a right that can't be repealed or restrained by any human law. It's a right derived from the great legislator of the universe. But here's the key word. He said, inalienable rights are antecedent to all earthly governments. Now, in the history of the world, 5,500 years of recorded history, whether you read the Bible or whether you read secular history, it doesn't matter, what is the first known civil government in the history of the world? Because he said inalienable rights came before earthly governments. Inalienable rights are what God gave to people before governments existed. So governments clearly didn't give those rights because they came before governments existed. The first known human government in the history of the world is recorded in Genesis 9. It's when Noah got off the ark and God gave him seven laws. We call them the Noahide laws. Here's what you'll do with murderers. Here's what you'll do with thieves. Seven laws that regulate how we treat each other horizontally. That's the first civil laws in the history of the world. Noahide laws. Now, significantly, John Adams said inalienable rights came before the first human government. Well, Genesis 9 is the first human government. So, Genesis 1 through 8, that's where, yeah. Genesis 1 through 8, they identified nearly two dozen inalienable rights, God, rights that God gave to them, like the right of self-defense. You know, we talked about the right of self-defense, the right of liberty, etc. So all of those were there and what God created before we ever had governments. So that's what we believed. And by the way, those rights, what were those two dozen? Well, in the Declaration of Independence, Sam Adams, father of the revolution, said, look, we told you in the Declaration that among other rights, you have the right to life, liberty, and property. And then 11 years later, when we finished the revolution, we said, you know, we told you there were three inalienable rights among others. Well, here's some of the others. Bill of Rights. You have the First Amendment right to worship God according to the dictates of conscience. You have the Second Amendment right to defend yourself. You have the Third Amendment right to the sanctity of the home. You have a Fourth Amendment right to justice and course. There's about 16 rights given in those 10 amendments. So those 16 rights, the three in the Declaration, give us about 19, and there's about two dozen some of the ones they didn't put in the documents called the right of expatriation, other things. So there's about two dozen rights they found out of the Bible that existed before human government did, and those are the rights that government's not allowed to regulate. So that's our third philosophy of government, is there are a certain set of rights that government can't touch. They can't regulate how you worship God. They can't tell you where you can worship God. They don't have the right to tell you you can't mention God at graduation at a school. They don't have the right to tell you you can't have a Ten Commandments outside. See, that, that's not the government's role. Now, it is in a secular world, but in a world where God said, acknowledge me. That's the first thing in the Ten Commandments. I'm the Lord thy God. Acknowledge me. That's what we used to believe. So that's our third point. The fourth point that made America different was that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. To secure what rights? inalienable rights. 
to make sure that you have your inalienable rights is why we have government. See, government was created to make sure you could practice those two dozen rights without interference. Uh, James Wilson, founding father, who signed the Declaration of Constitution, started the first law school in America. I have his original law books. George Washington put him on the Supreme Court as a justice. He said, guys, he's telling law students, here's why we had the American Revolution. He said, the principal object of government was to acquire a new security, the possession of those rights which we were previously entitled by immediate gift of our all-wise, all-beneficent creator. You see, in Great Britain, as British citizens, we used to have inalienable rights. We had the Magna Carta, we had the British Bill of Rights, we had all these rights. And then King George III comes along and says, no, 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 you can't choose what church you're going to, you're all going to be Anglicans. And then he comes along and says, no, 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 you don't own property, I'm the king, I own all the property, your property. And he said, we, we used to have all these inalienable rights, and then the king took them away. So we had to create a new security for the enjoyment of those rights that we previously had. See, that's why we had the American Revolution, was so we could go back to protecting inalienable rights. That was the purpose of government, and that's what he explains in law school. That's why we did the American Revolution. You also have Sam Adams who said very simply, he said government was originally designed for the preservation of the inalienable rights. You see, when that first law was given to Noah in Genesis, now remember, before Noah, you had Adam and Eve, that, okay, then you got Cain, that wasn't too good when he killed Abel, but you have Enoch and Seth and all the others, and so the earth grows and grows, and what happens is it becomes so wicked. They're killing each other, they're stealing from each other, raping each other. God says, I've had it, I'm going to wipe them all out, we're going to start this again. So here comes the flood, then we come with Noah and his family, his three sons and their wives, and they get off. And God says, all right, now that we're starting this again, here's what we're doing. First thing he tells Noah in Genesis 9, 4 is, whoever sheds man's blood, by man will his blood be shed. If you find a murderer among you, you take him out. Now, why would he say that? Because he's trying to protect the inalienable right to life. What a murderer does is take someone's right to life. He kills someone innocently. He shouldn't be doing that. So if you find someone who's violating someone else's right to lie, you take them out. And here's what you're going to do with thieves because private property is enabled. See, the Noahide laws were all given to protect rights that God had already given to man that man was not respecting. That's why government exists, is to protect the rights that God has given us. So that's the fourth. The fifth thing dealt with the consent of the government, what we call the will of the majority. But it is significant that of the five principles that created American government, four of the five are God-centered. God gives us a set of rights and wrongs to which we must conform that establishes morality and truth. Second is there is a God, by the way, and it's our duty to acknowledge Him. The third is God gives us a certain set of rights, and the fourth is government exists to protect the rights that God gave us. See, that was the philosophy of American government. The fifth is above and beyond that you can vote on other things. We can vote on how wide the sidewalk should be, but we can't vote on whether we have the right to defend ourselves the right to worship God. We can't vote on that because those are God-given rights. We can't vote on whether murder should be a crime or not or whether marriage should be between a man and a woman. Those are already established by God. We don't get the right to vote on that. We get the right to vote on things that God hasn't dealt with. That was the American philosophy of government. That's what's made us different for so long. That's what we're getting away from right now. We're trying to act like so many other nations in the world. But it's interesting, all across Europe, there are Christian nations trying to get to what we're running from. In Poland, in the Czech Republic, in Ukraine, in Hungary, they are, I mean, I've spent a lot of time over there with their leaders. They want to be solid Christian nations. They are Christian nations, population between 85 and 93 percent Christian, most of those nations. They want to be biblical. While we're trying to run from it, they want what we used to be. So you guys, you're the next set of leaders. Understand the foundations. Understand that this is not a secular thing that God has given.